Lord Christ, as I speak this morning, I ask that your Holy Spirit guide my words and give us understanding and insight into your heart and to why it is that the world is the way it is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a famous Scottish philosopher by the name of David Hume and he once wrote this on the problem of pain and suffering in the world. And he said that if God is willing, God is willing to prevent evil but not able, then he is a powerless God. But if he is able and not willing, then he is himself evil. But if he is both able and willing, then why is there evil and suffering today? Hume's conclusion, given that there is obviously evil and suffering in the world, is that therefore the existence of God is open to serious question. Basically what Hume is saying is that there's evil and suffering in the world and God is able to do something about it and God is willing to do something about it then the obvious conclusion is that he should do something about it. And the fact that it still exists in the world today then obviously God can't exist. But my, actually I think it's Hume's conclusion that is actually open to serious question because he doesn't actually allow for other possibilities. He doesn't actually consider other things that actually account for why we actually have suffering in the world today and why at one level God is actually constrained from doing something about it. But it is a difficult question and it is a very real question down through the centuries that people have asked and continue to ask today. In fact I know of one young woman who doesn't come to church at the moment because she can't actually find a, an acceptable answer to this question. And if I could sum up these questions up into just one question, it would probably go like this. If God is so powerful, and if God is so loving, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there starvation in Africa? Why is there child abuse here in New Zealand? Why are there mass graves in Kosovo? And why is there what's happening in Syria and the like? Why is there terrorism in the world? Why are there diseases like anthrax and Ebola and so on? Why is there rape, murder, torture, earthquakes, famine and more all over the world. Why? Now they're pretty hard questions at one level and to be honest with you it's not always easy to address this kind of question because while I can probably give you and I believe I can give you an answer as to why there is suffering there will be people in this room who've actually experienced suffering in a very personal kind of way and while what I say might actually help a little in terms of explaining it, it actually won't remove the hurts and the pain that you're actually experiencing. But I want to go have a go at answering the question because I believe it's an important issue to try and come to grips with. Because for many people it becomes a barrier in their relationship with God and for others it's a stumbling block to any relationship with God at all. So what is suffering? Let's start with that question. What is suffering? How would you define it? Possibly the best way is to look at a couple of examples. And I'll look at two examples. One is from the physical side of the equation and one is from the moral. What about a person who's suffering from some kind of terrible disease that's going to kill them? Cancer maybe. How would you define suffering in that case? What's the suffering involved for that person? For a start, there is the physical suffering. The pain that they actually experience as the disease begins to invade their body and gradually destroy it. But we can't just limit it to the physical pain, can we? Because there's also emotional suffering as the person realises that they're going to die and as they struggle to come to terms with that, thinking about the people that they, they will never see again, thinking about dreams for the future that won't now happen, wrestling with the fact of death itself. But the suffering isn't limited just to that individual, is it? Because every one of us have people who love and care about us. And so when we suffer, they too suffer. And their suffering will be emotional as well as they come to terms with the loss of their loved one. But there could also be a physical component to that suffering because if the person dying meant that maybe a mortgage could no longer be paid or something like that or bills no longer uh, covered, then that family will suffer through the loss of a home or possessions and so on. Suffering comes in many levels. What about this case? What is the suffering involved in child abuse? There is, of course, the physical suffering that occurs because of the act, but there's also the long-term emotional <coughs> suffering and scarring of a child whose trust has been shattered forever, whose idea of what love is has been distorted, whose ability to enter into healthy relationships in the future has been handicapped 
than who feels like they're worthless because of what's happened to them. So what is suffering? In each of these cases above, the pain and the hurt that the people experienced, whether it was physical or emotional or moral, come about when their lives depart from what we might see to be the norm, from the usual expected pattern of life. There is, as it were, a set of norms under which our life normally functions when everything's going well. Standards regarding our health and emotional well-being. And it's whenever those standards get deviated from, for whatever reason, it's then that we begin to experience suffering. But for most of the time, we're not worried about it. You know, I play hard on Friday nights at youth group playing soccer and I wake up in the morning and I'm a little bit stiff because I've got lactic acid in my muscles, right? That suffering. Am I bothered by it? No. It's just a sign that I'm alive. I'm at one level it's good to have it. Um, but it's still suffering. Do I blame anyone for it? Not really. It's just part of being a physical person living in this world. But it's a deviation from the norm, so to speak. In every case, suffering is a deviation from the norm. But when we really get to worry about it, it's usually when it's moral suffering. When it's moral suffering when it's someone else impacting upon the life of another. But before we get to that, suffering in itself is actually not necessarily bad. In fact, often it serves as a warning bell for us to do something to protect ourselves. Philip Yancey has written a brilliant book on this whole topic called Where is God When It Hurts? I encourage you to read it. But in it he tells a story of a basketball player, Bob Gross. And Gross played for the NBA and he insisted once on playing in a very key game, despite the fact that he had a badly injured ankle. Knowing that Gross was an important part of the team, the doctor, the team doctor, injected Marcane into his ankle in three different spots. Very, very strong narcotic painkiller. Gross started the game and was able to play because he wasn't feeling what was happening in his ankle. But after a couple of minutes, as he was batting for a rebound, everyone on the court heard a very loud snap. Everyone heard it except Gross. He was oblivious to the break. His ankle had broken. And he continued to run up and down the court just twice more before he collapsed to the ground. He felt no pain, and yet a bone had been broken in his ankle and it finally collapsed as he ran. By overriding pain's warning system with the anaesthetic, the doctor had caused permanent damage and his career was over. Pain serves a purpose sometimes. A similar thing happens with leprosy patients. You probably all know that with leprosy. When you see all the pictures on TV or on the internet or magazines of leprosy patients, most often what you see are people who've been maimed or have had amputated fingers or hands and so on, have got large ulcers and things all over their body. That's actually not the leprosy. That's one of the things that happens because of the leprosy. Because one of the things that leprosy does is actually destroy the nerve endings. And so you can actually no longer feel pain. So you might be standing beside an oven and your might, hand might be resting on the oven and your fingers might be burning but you won't even be aware of it until someone draws your attention to it or you start to, start to smell something going on. That's actually literally what happens and so they end up with horrendous injuries that often result in amputation and the like. They end up with a little cut that turns and gets ulcerated and starts to bleed and they don't even know it's happening because it's in a part of their body they don't usually see. Without the pain receptors, the nerves that cause us to fall, it stops us from actually getting more badly hurt. Even emotional pain like depression actually is a helpful thing. Depression is a signal by the body and mind that there is grief or hurt or stress in your life that's got to a point that you can no longer cope with life. And so what your brain does, it's a built-in mechanism as it starts to drop the serotonin levels between the nerve receptors in your brain so that it actually sort of like numbs you down a little bit so you don't actually burn out emotionally. The very same nervous system that allows you to feel the joy of an embrace or the pleasure of a kiss or warns you of danger when you touch fire or cut yourself is also the one that warns you of danger when you touch a fire or cut yourself. You can't have one without the other. So suffering in itself is actually neutral. It's a response to the things that are happening to us. What is more critical is that question of cause. Where did the suffering originate from? 
And traditionally we break it down into two categories. There is moral and physical or natural. And natural suffering is things like floods and earthquakes and disease. And then there is the suffering that comes from moral causes. And it's the moral suffering that I want to look at today. So what is moral suffering? That's the suffering that comes about because of the free willed actions or choices of people that affect other human beings. And it includes rape, murder, war, child abuse, terrorism and the like. It's what happens when people choose to do something that results in the suffering of others. And it can either be deliberate or unintentional. For example, a lot of the pollution we have spilled into our environment today is carcinogenic. And some of the cancers that people get today can be traced back to the effects of this pollution in the environment. In fact, most of the suffering, I believe, in this world can be attributed to, in some way to moral causes because of the way we treat each other. You only have to read the newspapers, you only have to watch the news to see how badly we treat each other. Moral suffering is due to the actions of our fellow human beings. It wasn't God who built the gas ovens that killed the Jews at Auschwitz. It wasn't God who took up arms on the streets of Syria and Damascus and started shooting each other. It's human beings who do that stuff. We are the ones who are responsible, not God. But that does raise the question, doesn't it? That even if we might not, even if God might not be responsible for a lot of the suffering in the world, surely he's got the power to stop it. And if he does have the power to stop it, why doesn't he? That's the real question. Why doesn't God step in and stop people hurting each other? And that's the question that Hume was really raising with his statement at the beginning. And the answer to that question, I believe, lies in the type of relationship that God wants to have with us as human beings. The Bible teaches very clearly that when God created us, he made us with a free will. He gave us the ability to choose, to choose between right and wrong, to choose to love or to choose to hate. God gave us choice and he did it for a very special reason and it's because he wanted to have a relationship with us. And you can't have a relationship with creatures who don't have the ability to choose. If God had made us in such a way that we had to love him, that we had to choose to do what he wanted, then it wouldn't have been true love. Think about Hume's statement again for a moment. Because although he's written something that sounds very clever and rational, or maybe even convincing, it doesn't take into account the full character of God. Basically what Hume's statement amounts to is that he doesn't believe in God, and in essence he's just trying to disprove the existence of God on the basis of suffering that it shouldn't exist in a universe where there is an all-powerful and all-loving God. But what Hume ignores is the fact that sometimes, even though we are both willing and able, there are circumstances that are beyond our control that constrain our ability. Let me give you an example. Let's say you've got a married couple. They've been happily married for quite a number of years, but then through a very series of difficult situations, they get to that point where the relationship is beginning to fall apart and the wife wants to leave. The husband, on the other hand, doesn't want it to go. He still loves her. He thinks they can work it out. What are his options? He wants the marriage to work. In other words, he wants her to stay in the home together. Is he actually able to make her stay? And the answer to that question is no, he can't. Sure, he might want her to be there, and he might maybe be even able to physically restrain her. He could put her in a room and lock the door. He could handcuff her. He might even work out some kind of legal thing where she can't leave the house. But the end result of all of that it's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's going to be a disaster. That's not going to save his marriage. She's been forced to stay somewhere physically where she doesn't want to be. She might be physically there, but emotionally, in every other way, she's not there. She wants to go. And even though he might physically be able to keep her there, the marriage is still over in many ways. And that's the problem with Hume's statement. Hume assumes that an all-loving God will put a stop to suffering, but he doesn't consider what's involved in doing that. In order for God to stop suffering, he would have to impose his will upon us. And he would have to suppress our will. And instead of being a loving God, he would then become a tyrant. How would that wife feel about this husband who's restraining her from leaving the house? She'd hate him all the more. How would we think of God if he was physically restraining us and imposing his will upon us 
to stop us doing the things that we wanted to do. We wouldn't like it. And that's why God has given us free will. So that the relationship we enjoy with him would be a free one. One that then would be out of genuine love. But if you give someone free will, there's always the danger that they might choose not to love you. A very famous t-shirt slogan. I like your one, Wayne, actually. <laughs> That's what awesome dads look like. There's another one that goes like this. If you love something, let it go. If it comes back, it's yours. If it doesn't, it never was. kind of describes the situation that exists between us and God. He's got to let us go. God took the risk. He gave us freedom. And by and large, humanity has chosen not to follow. We've gone the opposite way. We've chosen to disobey. And because of that, the world is in the mess that it's in today. It started within just a couple of generations, didn't it? Think about what happened with the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. You know, that's where it began. Murder, hatred, envy, violence, and it's just spread. Now you could still say, well, God, just do it anyway. You know, just impose your will. Stop the suffering. Set them. But that raises another question. How could God actually do that? Yes, he could. He could do something. But how would he do it? What would God do? For example, if someone picked up a gun and wanted to shoot me. You know, someone walked into this church and stood here in front of me and put a gun to my head and said, I want to shoot you. How would God stop that person from doing that? Physically, God could get in the way. You know, spiritually, you know, just get in the way of the bullet. Put a finger in the barrel or something like that. Maybe he could physically stop the gun, the gunpowder from working within the bullet. That wouldn't stop the hatred and the motivation that exists in the mind of the person who walked in here to pull the trigger in the first place, would it? That hatred and everything would still be in the mind of that person. And imagine what this world would be like with God intervening every second of every day, diverting cars driven by drunk drivers, altering gravity every time someone falls to soften their landing. The world would become impossible to live in. And at what point should God intervene? Should he close off your stomach when you're eating too much? Should, you know, obesity is a problem, it's causing suffering. Should he turn wine into water when you're drinking too much? Should he close your mouth when you're about to say something that's going to hurt another person? Physically stop you from speaking? Should he lock the door of the room of the child that you want to walk into and hurt? This can't work, can it? If God was altering the physical laws every second of every day all over the place to stop us doing things that are going to hurt others it would become an unworkable unlivable world how do you stop human beings from choosing to do things that are going to hurt themselves or hurt others how do you do that without making the world unlivable there's only one way God would have to enter into the mind of the person who wants to cause the hurt and stop them from doing it there. He'd have to exercise some kind of thought control over the person. But that would mean that for God to stop all the suffering in this world, he would have to invade the minds of every person living on this planet. Every person. And control their thinking. And the moment he does that, where does freedom happen? It's gone. Free will, it's gone. Completely gone. The moment he does that, we become machines. Total machines. And how would you feel if you knew there was someone inside your head making you think a certain way? Or when you're about to go and do something that might hurt another or yourself, suddenly it's like you go blank and, you know? How would you feel if you're aware of that presence in your mind? He would, if you were aware of it, you'd resent God. Again, you'd see him as a tyrant forcing you to behave and no one can have a relationship or love a tyrant. How does it make sense? God respects us and loves us too much to take away free will even though suffering will be a consequence of it. So what's the real solution? What can God do? Well, let me ask you a question. Who is it when you're going through something hard who can bring you the most comfort? You know, when you're going through a tough time, who is it that comforts you? Anyone? 
people who love you, care about you, stand alongside you, who pray for you, who will yeah, lay hand on you and pray for you. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. We are God's hands and feet in this world. Sorry, Julie, did you have your hand up? I was going to point out the invisible hands that uh, bring these people in the That's right. God's Holy Spirit prompting people to go to others. And, yep. yeah. But you know, the person... You know, all of that is true, but sometimes the person within that group of people who's maybe been through something similar to what you're going through, maybe that person is the one who, who can most help you because they know what you're going through. They know how you feel. I know how you feel. You know, I've been through something similar. And you know, that's what God did. God chose in the form of his son, Jesus, to give up his divinity, to give up all of his power that made him who he was, to give up everything and to take on human form and to come down to this earth and live as one of us. God in Christ knows what it means to be like a child growing up. He knows what it means to trip and skin your knee. He knows what it means to have brothers and sisters and probably sibling rivalry. He knows what it means to go to school. In Christ, God knows what it means to be made fun of because remember, Jesus would have been seen as an illegitimate child. He knows what it means to be a teenager struggling with pimples in adolescence. He knows what it means to be loved, nurtured and counselled by a dad and then to have that dad die because Joseph probably died when Joseph was a teenager. Which means he then had to assume responsibility for his mum and for his family. Jesus knows what it's like to grow up in a sole parent family. He knows what loneliness is. He knows what it means to weep at the grave of close friends like Lazarus. He knows what betrayal feels like. He knows what it means to experience pain, to be tired, hungry, angry, sad. And he even knows what it means to face death and to die as a human. In every possible way, virtually, Jesus knows what it means to be one of us and to suffer like we suffer because he's been here. And he's lived a life. He's gone through it. He understands so God's not going to take away your free will. But in Christ, you know that when you pray, you have someone who can identify with your suffering, who can identify with you in the human condition. And I would encourage you when you're going through tough times to pray to God, to pray to Christ, and to know that when you do, you're praying to someone who really does understand. But there's one more thing. The cross and what happened to Jesus on it wasn't just so that he could have empathy with us. It was also part of God's bigger plan. A, God, a plan that God set in motion from the beginning of time to bring a complete end to evil, to suffering and to pain. The Bible teaches that God is moving behind the scenes in history in such a way as not to take our, our free will but to move history towards an expected end. And just as the cause of our problem is a turning away from God, so the cross provides a way for us to return to God. And for those who choose to return to God, there is the hope that there will come a time in history when God will bring all suffering to an end, and that upon our death we will be resurrected to a life without pain. As it says in Revelation, Now the dwelling of God is with us, and he will live with us. We will be his people and God will be with us and be our God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more funerals, no more crying, no more hospitals, no more pain, no more cancer. For the old order of things has passed away. And for Christians, to go through time to suffer. That gives us great hope. For well, although we know we might suffer for a short time on this world, we know that there is something much, much better to look forward to. Let us pray. Father, when I think of Mary, I think of her lying on that hospital bed, and I think of the pain that she was going through. Some of it deliberately chosen because she chose to avoid having morphine so that she could be more alert for when Kayla finally arrived down from, from Nelson. But in the midst of it all, Mary knew 
that she had a living hope and faith in me. She knew that this was not the end, that even though she was going through something she wouldn't have wanted to go through, she knew that it wasn't the end of everything. She knew that there was a life beyond awaiting her. And Lord, I look forward to catching up with her again. May that hope that we have, that answer to the difficult questions, be something that we let the world know about.